Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Let's begin in prayer, and then I'm going to ask Andy to introduce a man who needs no introduction tonight, and, uh, and that's Professor Daniel Garland. Let's begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our speaker this evening is a Ph.D. candidate in the Systematic Theology at Ave Maria University. Daniel Garland earned his Master's in Theology from Franciscan University of Steubenville and his Bachelor's in Theater from Florida State University. He has taught theology at Ave Maria University and Christendom College. His articles have appeared in Homiletic and Pastoral Review, The Angelicum, and National Catholic Register. He's also the first English translator of St. Jerome's commentary on the prophet Haggai. Daniel lives in Southern Maryland with his wife and five children, where he is currently teaching theology at St. Mary's Riken High School. And most of all, he's a friend, close friend of the Institute. And we uh, welcome Professor Garland tonight. Welcome. Thank you very much, Andy. So uh, tonight's talk is called The Letter of Aristeas, How the Septuagint Came to Be. First of all, we should say that the Septuagint, uh, that the term Septuagint refers to the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And be before we get into the actual text of the Letter of Aristeas and find out how this Greek text of the Old Testament, this Greek translation of the Old Testament came to be, we need to first set the stage um, and, and, and talk about a little bit of the cultural background that went into all that took place for bringing about this translation. And we want to do so first by uh, looking at two things. One, how did the Jews end up in Egypt, first of all? And second, how did the Greeks get there, right? So, for the first, we can look at the book of Jeremiah. And I know uh, Father uh, Sebastian Carnazzo just gave a great talk a couple of weeks ago on uh, Jeremiah and how the Jews ended up in Egypt. So we don't need to dwell on this particular point for too long, but there are some things for uh, those who didn't see that lecture that we want to set the stage for. So, first of all, we see in Jeremiah 42, which takes place around the year of 587 BC, that after a group of Jews who had managed to escape the deportation uh, to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians, you have a remnant there who is, is remaining, and Jeremiah is amongst them. And Jeremiah warns them not to flee to Egypt. Stay where you are. Worship the one God, Yahweh, and all will be fine. And, uh, you know, he says, but if you don't listen to me, if you decide to go to Egypt, the result will be that you will face both sword, the sword you're trying to flee, which is the Babylonian persecution, but also famine. Right? And so Jeremiah prophesies that Babylon will eventually overtake Egypt. And what they were trying to escape from, they'll... Uh, suffer anyways. So it's best just to stay here in the land. Now, Jeremiah 43, you turn to Jeremiah 43, and we can see their response. We read in Jeremiah 43, verse 1, when Jeremiah finished speaking to all the people, all these words of the Lord their God, with which the Lord their God had said to them, Azariah the son of Hushaiah, Hushaiah and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the insolent men said to Jeremiah, you are telling a lie. 
the Lord our God did not send you to say, do not go to Egypt to live there. But Baruch, the son of Neriah, has set, uh, set you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they may kill us or take us into, Bab- into exile into Babylon. So Johanan, the son of Kariah, and all the commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. But Johanan, the son of Kariah, and all the commanders of the forces took all the remnant of Judah who had returned to live in the land of Judah from all the nations to which they had been driven, the men, the women, the children, the princesses, and every person whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikim, son of Shaphan, also, and this is important, also Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch the son of Neriah. And they came into the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they arrived at Tephan, Tepanes. Right, so you have here the people, the remnant of the Jews that escaped the Babylonians. They didn't listen to Jeremiah. They end up taking Jeremiah and Baruch by force to Egypt. And of course, in Egypt, Jeremiah continues to prophesy, saying, hey, you didn't listen. Babylon's coming. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to reap what you've sown. Right? And, of course, nobody likes a loud mouth. And what ends up happening, uh, tradition tells us, is that Jeremiah was eventually stoned to death by his fellow Jews. Right? So that doesn't end well. Meanwhile, the descendants of this remnant that's in Egypt, uh, they, they start to live there and grow in the land of Egypt. And they do so all through the time of the worldly domination from the Babylonians to the Persians, all the way down to the Greeks, which brings us to our particular document tonight, the letter of Aristeus. But before we get there, we have to say, how did the Greeks get there? And to do that, we have to back up a little bit to Alexander the Great, one of the great military leaders of history. Alexander grew up under the tutelage of the great philosopher Aristotle, uh, I would say the greatest Greek philosopher. And Alexander began his reign after the death of his father, Philip of Macedon, in 336 BC. And he soon proved to be a brilliant military commander. He commenced his military campaign against Persia in 334 BC. And he first succeeded in capturing Asia Minor, and then he moved southward along the Mediterranean, down through Palestine, and finally into Egypt in 332 BC. Well, the Egyptians, who had long been under Persian rule, when Alexander came in, they welcomed him as a hero, and they made him pharaoh. Uh, by 326, Alexander was, he was tired of being in Egypt. He wanted more. He wanted to conquer the whole world. And so he set out east through Mesopotamia all the way to the Indus River Valley in India. So in just eight short years, Alexander the Great managed to conquer most of the known world. And with him conquering the world, he brought Hellenization, which is the proliferation of Greek cults and culture with him. So at this time, Hellenization is spread out through most of the known world. And it takes its root in Alexandria, right, down in Egypt. Uh, we can see a kind of summary of this in sacred scripture. If you turn to 1 Maccabees 1, verses 1 to 9, we have a, a short of summary here. After Alexander, son of Philip, the Macedonian, who came from the land of the Kittim, that's the Greeks, had defeated Darius, king of the Persians and the Medes, he succeeded him as king. He had previously become king of Greece. He fought many ba- battles, conquered strongholds, and put to death the kings of the earth. He advanced to the ends of the earth and plundered many nations. When the earth became quiet before him, he was exalted and his heart was lifted up. He gathered a very strong army and ruled over countries, nations, and princes, and they became tributary to him. After this, he fell sick and perceived that he was dying. So he summoned his most honored officers who had been brought up with him from youth and divided his kingdom among them while he was still alive. 
And after Alexander had reigned 12 years, he died. Then his officers began to rule, each in his own place. They all put crowns on, uh, put on crowns after his death, and so did their sons after them for many years, and they caused many evils on the earth. Now, uh, Maccabees goes on to tell uh, about the one of these kings, which is King Seleucus, who is uh, has taken over Palestine uh, at the time of the Maccabees, right? And and the evil things that happened with the Seleucid dynasty. Uh, but that doesn't concern us tonight. What concerns us is one of the other four successors of Aristotle, which is Ptolemy the First Soter. Ptolemy the First Soter. When he takes over, what he does is go, uh, he sets up his kingdom in Egypt with Alexandria as the capital. When he's there, he decides to build this great library, right, which you are all familiar with, I'm sure, the library at Alexandria. It's famous for its uh, collection of books, even more than my own collection here. It's, it becomes the center of learning in the Greek world, uh, in the whole world, really. So what happens is Ptolemy, after he sets up Alexandria as his capital, he decides to go and uh, conquer Palestine. Uh, and as he does this, he uh, takes it over from uh, the Seleucid king. And in this conquest, he captures many of the Jews who are there and brings them, enslaves them, uh, and brings them down to Egypt. Now, over the time, Ptolemy I and his son, who succeeds him, Ptolemy II, Philadelphus, prove to be quite amicable overlords, if, if one can be such a thing. They, they were amicable overlords for the Jews in Palestine, uh, which led to a wide voluntary migration of many of the Palestinian Jews down to Egypt. Um, And so this, of course, brings an influx of even more Jews to Egypt in the diaspora, right? The diaspora uh, uh, describes the, it's it's the dispersion, right, of, of the Jews in lands outside of their homeland of Palestine. Right, so that sets the stage. That, that, that gets us to how we both have the Jews in Egypt and how the Greeks got there with Greek culture and, and thought. Now we can turn to the letter, our second part of our outline here, the letter of Aristeus and the development of the Septuagint. So with this influx of Jews into Egypt and with the Greek control of Egypt, we, we have the stage of the writing of the letter of Aristides. At this time, Jews living outside of Palestine in the diaspora vastly outnumbered those Jews living in Palestine. And uh, the center of this diaspora of Jews was located in Egypt in Alexandria. Now, since Greek was the lingua franca, Franca of the world back then, it's quite natural that the Jews living outside of Palestine who aren't speaking Aramaic uh, all the time are going to tend to forget uh, their natural tongue and pick up the common language of Greek. Uh, as, as many immigrants coming from Europe to America, they forget their natural tongue and they start speaking English. So the same happened with the Greeks in Egypt. Uh, and so this poses a serious problem for Jews outside of Palestine. They're cut off from the original language of their sacred text. Now, this problem is solved with the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language, uh, our Septuagint. Right? Now, the letter of Aristeus tells us how this story came to be. And it's written for two, primarily for two key reasons. The first is that it's sort of uh, an apologia, an apology, uh, to set forth the legitimacy of the Septuagint translation, right? to say, hey, look, just because it's in Greek, it's not in Hebrew, it's just as valid. And the second reason is that it's an apologia in favor of showing the superiority of Judaism and the Jewish law over paganism. 
specifically over the Greek Egyptian paganism under the Ptolemaic dynasty that ruled Egypt at this time. All right, so chapter one of Aristeus, it sets the stage by revealing that this is a letter of Aristeus uh, to his brother Philocrates, informing him about the wonderful events that occurred during his visit in Jerusalem with the chief priest Eleazar. Uh, Aristeus is presented as, throughout this story, uh, he presents himself as a Gentile, right? As a Gentile member of the court of King Ptolemy, who reigned from uh, 283 to 247 BC. Now, I say he, he's presented as a Gentile because we're going to see that there are things in this letter that sort of betray uh, that presentation, which we'll, we'll come to shortly. Now, Philocrates, the brother of Aristeus, is described as a lover of learning. Uh, and he is, he's one such that would be highly interested in learning about the latest collection to the Library of Alexandria, namely the Greek translation of the Law of the Hebrews. Now, Aristeus makes such makes make so much of Philocrates' intellect here in this first chapter that one can really get a sense of coinciding with the Hellenistic concern for Sophia, for wisdom, right? For the Greeks, this is prized above everything else. And Aristeus praises over and over again his brother Philocrates in terms of being one who models Greek Sophia. Now, uh, the chief priest of Jerusalem, we should know, is Eleazar. So his name will keep coming up, uh, just to set the characters here. We have Aristeus, Philocrates' brother, and Eleazar, the chief priest of Jerusalem. Now, Aristeus tells his brother that Demetrius of Phalaron, who is the keeper of the king's library, was tasked with collecting, quote, all the books in the inhabited earth. Now, at this time, Demetrius says there are over 200,000 books in the collection of the Library of Alexandria. Now, uh, Demetrius is, is hopeful that he'll raise that in a short time to 500,000. Once again, I wish uh, my library was as expansive. Demetrius tells King Ptolemy that he has heard that, quote, the law books of the Judeans are worthy of translation. And more importantly, for addition in King Ptolemy's library. Now, there's some debate exactly what is meant by, quote, the law books of the Judeans. Most scholars say that it, it is referring to simply the Torah, that is the law of Moses, the, the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. On the other hand, there are some scholars who suggest that uh, the entire Old Testament is in mind here. Uh, the, law, the, the, the phrase, the law books, being a sort of shorthand for both the law and the prophets, the entire Hebrew Bible. Most likely, it's referring to uh, the five books of the Pentateuch. Now, the king agrees with uh, this suggestion that it is indeed a worthy task to have this uh, knowledge, this wisdom, the Torah in his library. In fact, uh, this would be a prized addition to his library. However, there is one problem, and this is a major problem. These books of the Jews need to be translated. Right? But the Jews write with these funky characters. They're, they're the kind of square, right? And, and they read them backwards. You know, they're even more confusing than uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? So this is no easy task. So the king then uh, decides to order that letters be written to the chief priests in Jerusalem, Eleazar, so that he may provide Ptolemy with translators. Now, it is here that Aristeus sees an opportunity to petition the king uh, for a cause that is quite 
dear to his heart, namely the securing of the release of Jews who are held as slaves in Egypt. The very same Jews and and maybe some of their descendants, it it hasn't been a long time since uh, Ptolemy II's father reigned, Uh, some of these these slaves are the ones who Ptolemy I had taken down from Palestine into Egypt. Now, in the letter, this is put forth as uh, a pragmatic move, right? Since it would not be very diplomatic if uh, you're going to request from the high priest to have some Jew- Jewish translators sent to Egypt, well, at the same time, you're enslaving Jews in Egypt. So it's a very wise, a very shrewd move on the part of Aristeas. Now, Aristeas petitions the king. He says, quote, and this is on your uh, handout here, you can follow along. He says, let it never be unreasonable to be refuted by events themselves, O king. For since the laws have been established for all the Judeans, it is our plan not only to translate, but instead to also interpret them, right? So if we expect to have these Jews come and translate uh, their law for us, and we're enslaving them at the same time, they're not going to really let us know what's going on with the law, right? They can translate it, but somebody's got to interpret it, right? And they're not going to be the most willing people to do so if they look over across the street and see, oh, there's my fellow Jew there in chains, right? So let him go, he says, right? But what explanation shall we have for our mission? As long as multitudes of them are in subjection in your kingdom, instead, Out of your perfect and abundant soul, release those who are subject to misery. The same God who appointed their law prospers your kingdom, as I have been at pains to show. For these people revere the God who is the spectator and creator of all things, and whom all men reverence, including ourselves. But we, O King, call him by different names, such as Zeus and Dias. Now, consistently with this, our first ancestors demonstrated that the one by whom all live and are created is both the leader and the Lord of all. But I beg to you, set all humans an example of the splendor of your soul by releasing those who are held in slavery, right? Now, so you get the sense here that Aristeas is is two things. One, buttering up the king so the king will agree, and he does. But in the latter, the way it's presented is that if the king, and this is going to be a common theme throughout the letter, the king, Ptolemy II, is so wise, so uh, wonderful, so magnificent that he sees the need for uh, these books to be translated, right? If the king agrees with it, this wise Greek king, then the translation must be good. Right. So once again, it's an it's an apologia for the translation of the Old Testament Hebrew into Greek. So the king agrees, and then we move on to chapter two, and we find here in chapter two of the letter of Aristeas a copy of the letter of Demetrius, which he wrote to Ptolemy, informing him of the need for a translation of the Jewish law books. Now, uh, it's quite lengthy, this this little section here, but uh, there's some salient points in it that bears uh, reading all of it. So, Demetrius, to the great king, your order, O king, concerned with the collection of missing books needed to complete the library and of items which fell short of the requisite condition, And since I have given highest priority and attention to these matters, I now have the following report to lay before you. Books of the law of the Judeans, together with a few others, are missing from the library. For these works are written in Hebraic characters and language. But according to the report of the experts, they have been transcribed somewhat carelessly and not as they should be, for they have never been made with any sort of royal foresight. Once again, right, so... You, king, are going to have foresight here. You, king, are going to give legitimacy to this translation. Now, it is necessary that these works should also be made into an accurate version for your library. Because this, and this is a key point, this legislation, as could be expected from its divine nature, is also very philosophical and uncontaminated, right? So it's, it's divine in nature, but it's also something very near and dear to the Greeks, very philosophical. 
For this reason, both writers and poets and the whole multitude of historians have been re reluctant to refer to the previously mentioned books and to the men who have lived and are living in accordance with them because their conception of life is so pure and solemn, the conception of the life of the Jews, as Hecataios of Abdera declares. Therefore, if you approve, O king, a letter shall be written to the chief priests at Jerusalem, asking him to dispatch men of the most beautiful lives and who are elders skilled in matters pertaining to their law, six in number from each tribe, in order that they're probing the texts agreed by the majority and having achieved an accurate translation, we may produce an outstanding version in a manner worthy even of the contents of your purpose. May you be prosperous in every way. So we start to see here something, another theme that we're going to start seeing throughout the letter. These translators are the most worthy of men. These translators are, they, they excel all others on the face of the earth. Right, they're they're known for their uprightness, for their purity, for their keeping of the law, right? And so, it's, once again, this apologetic nature uh, of the work of these translators is is coming to coming to the forefront. Next, in the same chapter, we see a letter from Ptolemy to Eleazar, the chief priest, and it goes thus: King Ptolemaeus to Eleazar, the chief priest, greetings and good health. It is a fact that many of the Judeans settled in our country after being uprooted from Jerusalem by the Persians during the time of their mastery. But even more yet came with our father into Egypt as prisoners. He put many of them into the soldiery on larger salaries, but similarly, he, having so judged the veterans to be trustworthy, set up fortresses, which he handed over to them to prevent the Egyptians from feeling any fear on their account. But having also received the kingdom... We adopt a more humane attitude to all our subjects. Once again, right? So this, this king, he's, he's a great king. He's a friend of humanity. Even more, he's a friend to the Jews. But having also received the kingdom, we adopt a more humane attitude to all our subjects, but more especially to your citizens. We have freed more than 100,000 prisoners, paying to their captors the price in silver proportion to their honor. We also make amends for any damage caused by the violence of the crowd. We decided to do, do this as a pious obligation, making it as a thank offering to the greatest God, who has preserved the kingdom for us in peace and strongest glory throughout the whole inhabited earth. Right? You see, he's praising God here, the God, Yahweh. The thing about polyistic cultures, right? They'll, they'll, they'll worship the God of Yahweh, right? And, and they'll praise the God, right? But there's a sense here that this being written, we'll talk about the author a little later, right? There's a sense here that the author is putting in here that this is the true God, right? This isn't just one God among the whole pantheon of gods. This is it. This is uh, Yahweh, the one, right? Um, we decided to do this as a pious obligation, making it as a thank offering to the greatest God who has preserved the kingdom for us in peace and strongest glory throughout the whole inhabited earth. Also, those who are in the prime of their age, we have drafted into the army, but those who are also able to be attached to me, being worthy of trust in our, for our household, we have put in charge of some petitions. But it is our wish to grant favors to them and to all the Judeans throughout the inhabited earth and to future generations, right? So how is he going to do this? How is he going to grant favors to all the Judeans throughout the earth? He tells us, therefore, we have decided that your law be translated into Hellenic characters from what you call the Hebraic characters in order that they should also take their place with us in our library with the other royal books. So you get an apology, right? The Jews in Palestine who prize their Hebrew Old Testament, and they don't look too kindly on that Greek translation over there, the Septuagint, right? We have here this wise king, right? the wisest friend of humanity, saying that he's going to give this gift to all the Judeans of the world, right? And this gift is precisely the translation of the Jewish law into the Greek language. 
Therefore, you will act beautifully and in a manner worthy of our eagerness by selecting and dispatching elders of exemplary lives. Once again, right? The worthiness of the translators. Experience in the law and who are able to translate it. Six from each tribe so that an agreed version may be found from the large majority in view of the great importance of the matters under consideration. For we believe that the completion of this project will win us great glory. So we have six men from each of the 12 tribes of Israel being sent off to Egypt as translators to translate the law of the Jews into Greek. Now, if you're doing your math out there, you might realize that six times 12 equals 72, right? But the name Septuagint means 70, right? So something's off here, right? Uh, This coincides with the Jewish convention of rounding off, right? And uh, we see this sort of practice uh, in the New Testament, right? With Luke chapter 10, verse 1, where uh, Jesus is sending off missionaries out into uh, the field to uh, preach the gospel of the kingdom, right? And in, in some translations, some manuscripts, it says that 70 are sent out to preach the kingdom, while others say that Jesus sent out 72, right? Uh, 72, 70, it's rounding off, right? Besides, it's easier to say the 70 as opposed to the 70 plus two, as they would have said it in back then, right? So, and it's easier to write the Roman numerals. Uh, when you're referring to the Septuagint, uh, you have LXX, right? The 70. If you had LXXII, you know, that's it's a little bit long, right? So, uh, for, for brevity's sake, it's the Septuagint, the 70. Even though there are 72 translators, six from each of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, it's referred to as the 70. Now, chapter 3 gives an elaborate description of the table of sacrifice, right? The the very table of sacrifice that's in the holy place that King uh, Ptolemaeus sent to Eleazar as a gift. And then in chapter 4, it describes what Aristeus sees in Jerusalem, giving intimate details of the temple in Jerusalem and the ministry of the priests within it. Uh, here's, Here's a couple of snippets. The sacrificial altar was constructed in a manner commensurate with the place and the victims consumed in the fire. The ascent up to it was on a similar scale. Now, because the priests who were performing public service were swathed up to the loins in linen tunics, the site stairway was designed in a manner consistent with decency. Now, the house looks toward the east, but the rear of it faces west. Now the whole foundation was paved with precious stones and had slopes leading to the appropriate places for carrying the water, which is needed for the cleansing of the blood from the sacrifices, for tens of thousands of livestock are brought there in the festival days. Now, the author of the letter of Aristeus, he has intimate knowledge of the temple. He knows what's going on. What he describes here with the the house of the temple facing east, right? But the rare of it facing west and and all these precious stones inside of it, right? It's exactly what Ezekiel describes in his book when he has this vision of the temple. He's off in exile and he has this vision of the temple and he describes it in the same manner, right? That it faces east, right? And then the back would be the west, right? Which, of course, um, you may know, right? Um, I gave a lecture a while back uh, last year on Christ, the temple of God, that the East, right, it's modeled, the temple is modeled after the Garden of Eden, right? And where is the entrance? Well, we know uh, Adam and Eve were kicked out of Eden, and in the East was placed two cherubim, right, which is where the entrance is to stop Adam and Eve from coming back in, right? So, this this author here uh, begin to see right. He's very familiar with uh, Jewish law and scriptures, right? Uh, carrying on, he goes. He says there were many mouths. He's talking about the altar here. There were many mouths at the base of the altar, which were completely invisible to everyone except to those responsible for their public service, so that the large amounts of blood which were collected from the sacrifices were all cleansed by the downward pressure and momentum, right? So his description 
Uh, so this, this is fascinating, this description of the temple and the sacrificial table. But what is even more fascinating is his description of the priests in the ministry of the temple and that of the high priest and what the high priest wears, right? Now, this section is a bit lengthy, but it's, I, I think it's very important to see, really, to get a glimpse of who the author is. So we're, we're going to read uh, all of it here. Now he says, now the public service of the priests was in every way unsurpassable in its vigor and the arrangement of the orderly behavior and silence. For they all work hard of their own accord with much exertion, and each one looks after his appointed task, and their service is carried on without interruption. Indeed, some undertaking the carrying of wood, but others oil, but others wheat and flour, but others the sweet spices others offering the parts of the flesh for the Holocaust, all of them exerting the strength in different ways. For after they divide the legs of the bullocks with both hands, though they are more than two talents and weights in almost every case, they with an upward movement rip off with each hand in a marvelous way, a sufficiently large portion with unerring accuracy. Now the sheep and the goats are similarly treated in a marvelous way, despite their weight and amount of fat. For those whose concern it is, choose in every case, select specimen, specimens which are without blemish and outstanding for their fatness. This was how the previously stated procedure is carried out. Now they have a place of rest set aside where those who are resting sit down. But when this happens, some of those who are rested stand up. But no one orders the arrangements of their public service. Also, a general silence reigns, so that one might think that there was not a single human in the place, although the number of the public servants is more than 700. But there is also a multitude of the assistants who are bringing forward the victims for sacrifice. Instead, everything is carried out with fear, and also in a manner worthy of great divinity. Now, it was an occasion of great consternation to us when we saw Eleazar engaged in his public service with both his vestments and his glory, which was revealed in the tunic in which he was vested in the stones around him. For golden bells surrounded the hem at his feet, making a very special sound. Right? These are the bells that uh, the high priest on the Day of Atonement he goes into the Holy of Holies. This is the only time of the year where he's allowed to do it. And the bells there are there in case he dies, right? If, if the bells stop moving, then they know something's going wrong there. He also has a rope tied to him. So if the bells stop moving, they can drag him out, right? Because they can't go in there, only the high priest can. But alongside each of them are tassels adorned with flowers, which are of marvelous colors. Now he was clad in a resplendent, magnificent belt, woven in the most beautiful colors. But on his breast he wears what is called an oracle, to which are attached twelve stones of different kinds, glued together with gold, giving the names of the tribal chiefs according to their original order, each stone flashing its own natural distinctive color, quite indescribable. Right? These are the twelve stones representing the twelve tribes of Israel that the high priest wears on his vestments. Now on his head, he has what is called the tiara, but on this imitable turban, the royal diadem having the name of God, Yahweh, in relief in the middle in holy characters on a golden leaf, ineffable in glory. The wearer is considered worthy of wearing these vestments during the public services. Now the appearance of these things instills one with fear and disorder, so that a man would think he had entered the outside world. Right, so Eleazar, you can picture this. He sees this liturgy going on, right? And he says, right, the one who sees this is struck with fear and disorder, as if he's not in the outside world, as if he's transported up to heaven with God. Such is the Jewish liturgy, and such is the Christian liturgy, which carries over from that of the Jewish liturgy. Now, it's the consensus, right? So here we get to the author, right? It's the consensus of scholars that Aristeus, right, the, the author of this letter, is not who he says he is. Namely, he, he's presenting himself as a Gentile in the court of Ptolemy. 
Now, the reason why many scholars suggest that this isn't really the case, he's more likely to be some Jewish person who's writing this, right? It's true, he's writing this as an apologetic for the Septuagint um, and to show the superiority of uh, Judaism, its priesthood, its temple, everything about it, the laws of Judaism over against paganism. But beyond, beyond that, uh, they say that this is probably not a, a Gentile in the court of Ptolemy because there's one, the strong apologetic nature combined with several anachronisms that are found throughout the letter. All that aside, I think, I think here with these descriptions, especially the descriptions of uh, what's going on inside the holy place with the, the ministry of the priests and especially that of the high priest, that uh, the author gives up the game. Right. Such intricate detail betrays one who is an eyewitness. Right. Uh, it seems to me that the author was most likely uh, at one time a Levitical priest who ministered in the temple and eventually found himself down in Alexandria. Because you got to think about it. How could a Gentile, right, as he purports to be, how could a Gentile who was not allowed to pass further than the court of the Gentiles in the temple, let alone into the holy place on pain of death, how could he get there if he was a Gentile and not a Jew? So uh, this to me seems, the game's up. He, he, the author is a, a Jew, right? And so he has a strong apologetic for showing the superiority of Judaism over paganism. And he's a Jew in Alexandria. So he's reading the Septuagint, right? And so he has a strong uh, motivation to show that, hey, the Septuagint is just as legitimate as the original Hebrew. Now, it's almost as if the author forgets himself amidst uh, describing such beauty that is the temple liturgy. Moving on to chapter five, here the translators are once again praised for their qualifications. Uh, we have the description. It says, For the chief priests selected men of the best merit and of excellent discipline due to the distinction of their parentage. They had not only mastered the Judean literature, but instead had even made a serious study of the Hellenic, uh, Hellenic literature. Right? And that's what you would expect from a translator, right? Someone who knows both sides, right? Someone who knows the Jewish literature and the Hellenic literature, someone who knows the Jewish language, Aramaic, and someone who knows uh, the Greek tongue as well. That way they can accurately translate from one language to another. Then Aristeas tells us of a series of questions that he asks uh, the high priest Eleazar, in which Eleazar has an opportunity to point out the superiority of the law of the Jews um, and also at the same time condemn idolatry even the idolatry of the Greeks and the Egyptians, right? In fact, Eliezer says that it is precisely due to the idolatry of the nations that the law was given. He says, therefore, in his wisdom, the lawgiver, right, Moses, in a comprehensive survey of each particular part, being furnished by God for the recognition of everything, surrounded us with unbroken palisades and iron walls in order to prevent us from mixing with any of the other nations in any matter, thereby being kept pure in body and soul, preserved from vain glories, revering the only God and who is omnipotent over the entire creation, right? The law is this palisade, this fence that hedges the Jewish people in to keep them pure in the worship of the one true God. Eleazar goes on, Therefore, to prevent us from being perverted by contact with others or by mixing with base influences, he hedged us in on all sides by rules of purities and which are connected with foods and drinks and touches and hearing and sight all relating to the law. Now, uh, what, what Eliezer talks about here corresponds to the Old Testament prophets' own understanding of the majority of the law being given in response to idolatry, uh, most notably the idolatry of the golden calf and also the idolatry of the second generation in the wilderness at Baal of Peor. 
Chapter six is concerned with the reasoning behind the dietary laws of the Jews. And this is quite interesting here. In response to Aristeus, Eleazar assures him, quote, for you must not take the contemptible rationalization that Moses enacted this legislation because of an excessive preoccupation with mice and weasels or such like creatures, right? So you you get the picture, right? Aristeus has said, you know, it's common that people who aren't familiar with Judaism, they read about these dietary laws. You have unclean animals. You have clean animals, right? You can't eat mice and weasels, and you have to stay away from them. They're unclean. What's going on here, right? And Eleazar says, well, I've heard some of these, you know, some of the gossip out there about our laws. Don't believe them. Don't believe the rationalization that Moses was preoccupied with these creatures, right? Rather, these creatures serve a symbolic purpose, right? These creatures are considered clean or unclean in a way that is meant to symbolically point us to the truth. Right, Eleazar explains. He says, therefore, all the rules granting concession toward these and other livestock have been set out symbolically. For the cloven hoof and the separation of the claws of the hoof is a sign of setting apart each of our actions for what is good. The symbolism conveyed by these things compels us to make a distinction in the performance of all our acts with righteousness as our aim. But this also explains why we are distinct from all other humans. For the majority of other humans defile themselves through promiscuous intercourse, thereby committing great unrighteousness. And countries and whole cities take pride in these things. But we are quite separated from these practices. Right? She's praising the law. Look what the law does. The law makes us pure, unlike the other... nations, unlike the nations who are committing these uh, promiscuous fornications out there. We are kept pure because we are the people of God. Now, from here, there is a a shift in location. Aristeus goes back to Egypt, back to Alexander, uh, Alexandria, with the 72 translators, uh, and they come to the king's court. And uh, these next chapters are quite fascinating. Chapters 7 to 13 relate seven nights of drinking parties, right? Uh, these Greeks, they know how to party, right? So they get together each night, and there's, there's lots of wine. Everybody's having a great time. And then the king waits, right? He waits till everybody's relaxed, having fun. They've had a couple of glasses, you know? And uh, the king starts quizzing the 72 translators, right? He's trying to catch them on guard to see if they're really wise, right? As if they're up to the task of translating this Hebrew scriptures into the Greek language, right? Which the king prizes above all else, right? So the king questions on each night, he questions 12 of the translators, except for the last two nights, he questions 11, so we get 72, right? So there's 72 questions in these chapters, and they're quite fascinating. They read not only like wise sayings of the Greeks, but there is quite an affinity with the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, Proverbs, Sirach, and, and so forth, right? So uh, it's quite interesting. And it's, it's, it's a long read, but it's a fun read. And there's lots of good there. There's lots of stuff that uh, it mostly it's concerned with how can a king be such a king that he's loved by his people, that he's a wise king, uh, that he is a fair king, a just king and so forth, right? Now, the purpose of these chapters is to, once again, further establish the wisdom of these Jewish philosophers, right? And by extension, right, you notice I call them Jewish philosophers. These translators are now revealed to be philosophers, right? And by extension, and more importantly for our author, to reveal the excellence of their own translation of the Torah. Now, The argument goes, if these wise Jews who are praised by this wise king and also praised by the Greek philosophers who are in the court drinking along with them, 
if this is the case, how could anyone cast doubts and aspersions upon the legitimacy of their translation, right? The answer is they can't, right? These are the cream of the crop. These Jewish translators are more than translators. These are the quintessential wise men. Two examples of this uh, will suffice to illustrate the point. In chapter 9, on the third day, we read, Now when the king with a loud voice complimented and encouraged them all, that's the translators, those who were present expressed their approval, but especially the philosophers. For even these guests were far superior to the philosophers, both in their conduct and in their rationalization. Their starting point, being God himself. But after this, the king led the way in showing affection to them in their drinkings, right? And then after narrating the seventh day, Aristeus interrupts his story to offer an apology to his brother, Philocrates. He says, now, if I've dwelt at length on these matters, Philocrates, I beg your pardon, for I marveled at these men tremendously the way in which on the spur of the moment they gave answers which should have needed a long time to ponder. And indeed, the questioner gave great thought to each particular question. But those who answered gave their answers to the questions one after the other. Therefore, they were manifestly worthy of being marveled at by me and the audience, but especially by the philosophers, right? So once again, they're praised high above the rest. And then we come to the final chapter, chapter 14 of the letter of Aristeus. And we finally, after all this time, we get to the translation, right? What everybody's been waiting for. Demetrius takes the 72 translators off to a secluded island uh, so that they can take up their task undisturbed. Now, the letter of Aristeus waste no time in getting to the point, right? Very quickly, uh, this last chapter, chapter 14, boom, 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 it's done. In a mere 72 days, right? And this is, this is the miracle of it, right? This is the, uh, the greatness of the work. And this is, this is what kind of gives the letter of Aristeus a sort of legendary character. Legendary, I, I would caution you, doesn't always mean unhistoric. Right. In a mere 72 days, the translators complete their work after having consulted with each other and then arriving at a pristine translation. Demetrius then informs the king of the successful completion of the task. He says, now when the events were also reported to the king, he rejoiced greatly, for it seemed that the purpose which he shared had been safely accomplished. Now the entire version was also read by him, and he marveled profoundly at the mind of the lawgiver. And he spoke to Demetrius, how is it that none of the historians or poets have ever thought it was worth their while to allude to such a wonderful work? Now he declared, because the legislation is solemn and of divine origin, and because some of those who made the attempt were struck by God, they refrain from their design. Right. So it goes on here in um, chapter 14 to allude to the fact that there were other people who attempted to make a translation of the Torah into the Greek language, but they weren't worthy. But these 72 men, these wise philosophers, they are worthy. And their translation should be held up to the whole world as a gift to all the Jews in the diaspora as being the work of God. Right? After this, the 72 are sent back to Jerusalem with gifts for themselves and for Eleazar, the high priest. And Aristeus concludes the letter as such. Now, there you have my narrative, Philocrates, exactly as I professed. For I think that these matters will delight you more than the books of the mythologists, right? This isn't mythology, right? This is real. This is better than the Greek myths. For you are devoted to the study of those things which are able to benefit the mind. And to them you devote the greater time. But I will also try to write down the remainder of what is worthwhile in order that in going through it, you may achieve the very beautiful reward of your purpose. So write, once again, the apologetic is for the translation of the Septuagint, but also for the superiority of the Jewish law, Jewish wisdom, right? 
Philocrates, if you want to occupy yourself with true wisdom, it's in the Torah. It's in the writings of the Jews. Right. So uh, we can conclude this section here by stating that while the letter of Aristeus may be an apologetic work and it may not have been written by a gentle uh, Gentile of Ptolemy's court as it purports to be, it nevertheless, its overall historical value is to be upheld. Right. Um, we do know around the time of 250 uh, BC was when uh, this translation project of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek began. And, and, and you know, there might be some kind of legendary elements to the letter of Aristius, but the core of it is true. Now, uh, next section, the importance of the Septuagint. After this initial translation of the Torah into Greek, other scholars began to translate the rest of the Old Testament. So that by the first century BC, you have the entire Old Testament, including the so-called deuterocanonical books, translated. And we're going to come back to these deuterocanonical books. In, in the diaspora, right, outside of Palestine and the Jewish world, the Septuagint was widely used by the Jews. They didn't use the Hebrew version because most of them forgot Hebrew, right? So they use the Septuagint version, the Greek version of the Old Testament. And this is why in the letter of Aristeus, there is such a strong apologetic for it, right? The author wants to make known that its use is just as legitimate as Palestinian Jews' use of the Hebrew Bible, right? Further, having the scriptures of the Old Testament translated into the Greek was significant not only for the Jews before Christ to be able to share the teachings of Judaism with uh, the Gentiles, especially the Greek Gentiles, but it also allowed Greek wisdom to have a positive impact on Jewish thought and vice versa, for Jewish thought to have a positive influence on Greek thought, right, and Greek wisdom. Now, uh, this impact carries over into the Christian era as it allowed the Christians to be able to present the scriptures, both the old and the new, to the Greeks in their own language, right? And, and we know, we know the missionary impact that this had, right? Acts describes uh, St. Paul going off to the, all these Greek places, Ephesus, Thessalonica, Athens, Acts 17 on the Areopagus, right? And, and converting the, Jew, uh, the, the Greeks there, right? He's using the Greek version. In fact, the Septuagint was the preferred source for the New Testament authors when they quoted the Old Testament. In fact, it was the preferred version among the Jewish world, right? Up until the, um, of course, except for the Palestinian Jews who spoke Aramaic, but in the Jewish world and in the diaspora, the Septuagint was the preferred version of the Old Testament up until Christian times. It was only with, this, with the tension between Christianity and Judaism that uh, around a little after 70 AD, uh, when, when the Christians were expelled from the synagogue and so forth, the Jews said, look, you take the Greek we don't want it. We, right? We'll stick with the Hebrew. We know Hebrew, right? You keep the Greek, whatever, right? The Hebrews, ours, take the Greek. And, and, and they did, right? And so they used the Greek. The Greek Old Testament combined with the Greek New Testament is the Christian uh, scriptures, right? Uh, but it, it wasn't, right, up until 70 AD and a little bit after the Septuagint is still in use. It's used by Josephus, who is the Jewish historian, who, when the Romans came in in 66 AD, they laid siege to Jerusalem and eventually destroyed uh, the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Josephus uses the Septuagint as scripture, right, along with the Jewish philosopher Philo. And both of these men a claim divine status to the translation, right? That it was inspired. It was also highly prized by the fathers of the church. In a discussion concerning uh, the variations of the, the Hebrew and the Septuagintal account of Jonah's walking through Nineveh 
calling them to repentance. St. Augustine, no less, uh, in his book, City of God, says this. He says, I wish to avoid a lengthy treatment of this matter, however, and so I shall not demonstrate it by referring to the many instances wherein the Septuagint translation is thought to be discrepant with the truth of the Hebrew text, and yet is found concordant with it when rightly understood. Hence, even I, in my small measure, follow in the footsteps of the apostles, for they themselves quoted prophetic testimonies from both, that is, from both the Hebrew and the Septuagint. And I've deemed it right to make use of both as authorities, since both are one and both divine, right? St. Augustine held it to be divine. Augustine also brings up here an issue that Jews around his time, and uh, as well as many modern biblical scholars today, have raised in regard to the accuracy of the Septuagint. Uh, one of the reasons people kind of discount uh, the letter of Aristeus is because, and, and, and generally the Septuagint, is because they think that since there are many variant readings between the Septuagint and the Hebrew Bible, uh, that the Septuagint is the one that has a faulty translation, right? So if it has faulty translation, well, then it can't be divinely inspired. Well, this, this was the case up until the mid-20th century. Uh, what happened in the mid-20th century, right? Well, up to this point, our oldest manuscript, manuscripts of the Septuagint are from 400 AD, and our oldest Hebrew version of the Old Testament, called the Masoretic Text, is from the Middle Ages, right? But in the mid-20th century, what do we have? We have the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls on the, the Qumran area, right, um, on the Dead Sea. And this find of the Dead, uh, Dead Sea Scrolls revolutionized the study of the Septuagint because what we found here was that the Septuagint was often in more accord with the Dead Sea Scrolls than the Masoretic text was. Right. So what this tells us is that instead of the Septuagint being an innovation, rather the case is that the Septuagint witnessed to a, a variant Hebrew version of the Old Testament. Right. So the Septuagint wasn't tried and found wanting. It was found just as accurate. And in many cases, there's a preferential reading that comes from the Septuagint verified by the Dead Sea Scrolls than is found in the Masoretic text, right? So don't let anyone tell you that the Septuagint is not good, right? If it's good enough for Jesus and it's good enough for the apostles, it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me, all right? And it's good enough for Augustine. Now, uh, this final section I want to I want to talk about the canonical status of the Septuagintal books. Now, uh, this phrase, the Septuagintal books, I use this phrase over the phrase deuterocanonicals. Right? What are the deuterocanonicals? Deuterocanonical refers to uh, the second canon, right? And it refers to uh, seven books of uh, the Old Testament that are found in the Septuagint, but are not in the Hebrew version of the Bible. Tobit, Judith, Wisdom of Solomon, Sirach, Baruch, and First and Second Maccabees, right? Now, Protestants, and unfortunately some Catholics, call these seven books the Deuterocanonicals, right? Protestants also call these seven books, uh, these Septuagintal books, the Apocrypha, right? But that is a completely false term. The Apocrypha refers to false writings, whereas uh, these seven books are not false writings. False writings of the Apocrypha are books such as First Enoch, Jubilees, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, and so on, right? Historically, there was no second canon. Right. Historically, there was only one canon. Right. The Christian canon of the Old Testament was established, and this is on your handout. You can see this was established first in 382 at the Council of Rome, which was held under Pope Damasus, whose uh, feast day we just had a couple of days ago. Right. So if you look on the handout, in the decree on the canon at the Council of Rome, there isn't 
any talk about second canon or deuterocanonical books. All the books listed there of the Old Testament are the same exact books we have in our Catholic Bible today. There was only one canon of Scripture, right? And these seven books that the Protestants reject never had a secondary status. We can look at the later councils of Hippo in 393, the Council of Carthage in 397, and both of these councils affirm exactly what the Council of Rome in 382 affirmed, that there's one canon and only one canon, and these Septuagintal books, not the Deuterocanonicals, because there's no second canon, these Septuagintal books are included in that canon. We go on with our history. In 405 AD, Pope Innocent I enumerates the same books that were listed at Rome, Hippo and Carthage, as being canonical, right? But it doesn't stop there. From this point on time, up until 1442, we have silence. There's no more talk about the canon among the popes or the councils of the church, right? But then we have the Council of Florence in 1442, which, once again, lists the same exact canon of the Old Testament as had been previously stated in the prior councils with no mention of a second canon. So once again, there's always been and only been one canon and one canon alone. So then that brings us up to 1546 with the Council of Trent, which is reacting against Luther taking out... We didn't add books. Luther took out seven books from the Bible. And Trent is reacting to this, saying once again, reaffirming the very same list found at Florence, found at Carthage, Hippo, all the way back to Rome in 382. All the books mentioned for the Old Testament are the same books that are listed there on that handout for the Council of Rome in 382. So the conclusion that we come up with is that Martin Luther, in rejecting the seven books of the Old Testament, these Septuagintal books, he's siding with the Jews over against the unbroken history of Christianity when it comes to the canon of the Old Testament. So who are we going to side with? Why, why do the Jews have more authority in their canon than all the councils of the church? They don't. Now, now, in fairness, we should note, right, uh, when I say all the history of the church kept uh, one canon, this is to the point where somebody says, wait, 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 wait a second, Jerome. What about St. Jerome? In his prefaces to these seven Septu Septuagintal books for his Vulgate, his Latin translation of the Bible, he does quibble a little bit with uh, whether they're canonical or not. but. And I've translated Jerome. I, I can I, I know this for a fact. Everywhere in Jerome's commentaries on Scripture, he cites the Septuagintal version of these books as if they are Scripture. Right? There's only one canon, right? And that includes these seven Septuagintal books. So once again, I conclude with the Septuagint is good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for the apostles. It's good enough for me. Thank you so much, Professor Garland. It's wonderful. So we're going to go straight into Q&A. Hey, uh, Dr. Garland, thank you very much. Uh, very, uh, very enlightening. Really appreciate it. When I was in uh, uh, Islamic history class many years ago, they, they talked about how the Quran is translated. Some of this almost shapes up as if a bunch of Westerners ask some Muslims to translate the Quran for the Westerners. And so the, the, the Muslims told us what they think we need to know, vice a true translation. I just wanted to get your comments on that. So are you asking, is there some, something that the, these Jews left out of the translation into Greek, um, maybe that maybe Muslim translators of the Quran into English might have left out? Yeah, in, in, in a sense of, you know, I, the Muslim, gonna, I'm not going to tell you everything that's in there, but I'm going to tell you what I think you can understand or what you can handle or 
what I want to tell you, vice yeah. everything. Yeah, well, we, we, we know that that's not the case with the Septuagint because, uh, once again, we do have the corroboration with the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we have the Masoretic text, the Hebrew text, right? And uh, there's, there's small differences between the Septuagint translation and the Hebrew text, right? One of the big contentions amongst the, the Jews with the... Greek translation, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew translation comes from Isaiah 714. A virgin shall conceive and bear a child, right? In the Hebrew, the word is Alma, which the Jews will contend is a maiden. Uh, It refers to kind of a a young woman, whereas the Greek has Parthenos, right? Virgin in the Greek. And uh, the Jews will say, look, if, if uh, Isaiah was speaking about a virgin, they would have used the Hebrew word Bethula. But, they, uh, but Isaiah didn't. He used Alma. Well, there's a couple of things to answer to that. One, what is the average young woman? What is the status of the average young woman when Isaiah is writing? A virgin, right? So, I mean, that's really not an argument. Jerome picks this apart in his uh, dialogue um, against this. Also... So once again, the Septuagint version that had Parthenos in Isaiah 7, 14 was used widely by the Jews up until uh, the big split between Christianity and Judaism, right? So they were using it. They thought it was inspired. They had no problem with it until the Christians came in and said, hey, Isaiah 7, 14, that virgin who shall conceive a child and be called Emmanuel, that's Jesus Christ, right? So, yeah. Oh, thank you. We also have a question from Allison here. She asks, you mentioned uh, Josephus. I actually have a Protestant friend who uses Josephus' writing against Appian to suggest Josephus supported only a 22-book canon, in parentheses, a Hebrew canon, and he did not recognize the Septuagint. How would you respond? Yeah, I would respond once again, the same way I'd respond to Luther. Yes, it, it's true that the Hebrew Bible had a, right, it didn't include these Septuagintal books. I mean, that's common knowledge, right? But that doesn't mean that these seven books aren't inspired. We as Christians, we don't take our concept of canon from Josephus. We don't take it from uh, the Jews. We take it from what the church, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right, has, has deemed to be canonical, namely because they're suitable for reading in the liturgy, right? So, yeah, Josephus may um, have a shorter canon. We'd expect that, right? But that has no bearing on us as Christians. I was just kind of curious, um, you know, I mean, I always think, when I think of the Septuagint, I always think of Episciadzi, you know, its use in in Luke and in the Holy, in Holy Transfiguration, and that it came from the Old Testament. And it was used as a technical term, you know, which meant, you know, the, the glory cloud was overshadowing the Ark, the covenant. I guess I would say, where would we be if we didn't have the Septuagint? Yeah, it's a great question. Where would we be if we didn't have the Septuagint? It's, it's the Bible. All right, they, you know, Matthew did use, he did quote uh, from the Aramaic, right? But predominantly Matthew and the other New Testament writers, their Old Testament is the Septuagint, right? That's what they're using. And, and when they go off in to evangelize, it's the Septuagint that they're pointing out as scriptures to the Greeks, right? To the Gentiles. Yeah. Where would we be without the Septuagint? Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Garland. Thank you so much for, for spending your time with us this evening and for the excellent lecture. Great to see you all again. God bless. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.